one of the first, so far as I know, the first actual description of what we would now call a complete feedback loop goes back to Felix Linke, a German mechanical engineering professor who not only referred to an entire feedback loop as an object of concern, but illustrated it. Recall I said he was a mechanical engineering professor, and although his, the subject of the publication, the so-called mechanical relay, had to do with machines, that illustration over there of an organism, or more to the point of various human organs, comes from that publication. He was also the first one, so far as I can tell, who drew a correlation, a literal correlation, in terms of function between machines and biological organisms with regard to self-organization, uh, self-regulation, excuse me. In particular, he outlined four elements, four components that have to interact with particular functions to achieve this self-regulating function, and they map onto, although in a somewhat creative way. They map onto uh, the components of a classic feedback loop we know from the 20th century. Another interesting thing about Linke is his notion of the transmitter. By that I mean he's the earliest uh, scholar that I know of that in talking about self-regulation makes an accommodation for the notion of something being communicated, in this case feedback signal through the sensor. The sensor is the indicator, the controller is what he termed the executive, but he still had this other uh, component or aspect, the transmitter. And as such, he was talking about whatever it is that's going on. He didn't have the um, particular jargon that we would get bogged down in in the 20th century but he could point to what was going on. Meanwhile, biologists and people in medicine were coming to realize the notion of, thank you, of dynamic stability. The person most famous in this regard is uh, Bernard, who in speaking about the living body mentioned that it absolutely maintains some form of, some stable form or functional state under conditions of change, and that it does so, in effect, by operating within its own internal environment, as distinct from the environment surrounding it. In the early 20th century, this theme, which had continued, by the way, throughout the 19th century, would finally get a specific name, homeostasis, and be the object of concern of Walter Cannon his work fed directly into the coalescence of cybernetics, was specifically cited, and in at least one case, is specifically worked on by one of those founding members. If by founding member you mean someone participating in the Macy conferences. And that person would be Rosenblum. One reason I wanted to mention Arturo Rosenblum is because nobody else does except in passing, and because something he did at a meeting essentially sparked everything that would lead to cybernetics, or lead to the coalescence of a field or a term of cybernetics. As you can see, he was a Mexican physician, physiologist, well-educated, did a lot of work, had come to Harvard and had worked with Walter Cannon during the 30s on the notion of homeostasis and uh, Cannon's follow-up projects, which had to do with chemical mediation of nerve impulses. This neural work was dedicated to trying to figure out mechanisms of homeostasis. What's pertinent for cybernetics was that by 1942, while still hanging out at Harvard and working with Cannon, he hooked up with a couple of other characters, both of whom came from other fields. First, there was some mathematician named Wiener, and secondly, an electrical electronic engineer named Julian Bigelow. They co-wrote a paper basically centered on some ideas that Rosenblut had been working on up to that point, things which resonated with the other two, 
in their respective fields, but which Rosenblatt himself had been dealing with, mainly because he also had a big interest in the history and philosophy of science. This joint paper he would present in 1942 in May at a Macy Foundation meeting that had been assembled by invitation only on the subject of physiological mechanisms underlying the phenomena of conditioned reflexes and hypnosis as related to the problem of cerebral inhibition. Basically, conditioned reflexes and hypnosis. There were two people in experimental psychology, one of whom, the only one I remember to see, that would be Milton Erickson, who was the one who's going to talk about the hypnosis aspect. Sorry, I don't remember who it was. It was a, he was a big name at the time who is going to talk about conditioned reflexes. They gave their presentations. It went OK. Uh, Rosenblut had been offered a slot as one of the auxiliary speakers, and he presented this paper. And he, quite frankly, blew certain members of the crowd away. I'll get back to that in a minute. This would eventually be published in 1943 and would be the spark that led to the Macy conferences, which are usually taken to be the historical origin of the field of cybernetics. So Rosenblut is an extremely critical person in the storyline of what happened, what sparked, and so on and so forth. And his name is more alliterative with Richmond than, say, Wiener or anybody else I can think of. What was it he talked about that got the crowd's interest? He talked about cause, purpose, teleology. You have to remember that in the context of his interest in history and philosophy of science, he wanted to make sure that homeostasis, the kinds of phenomena he was researching with Cannon, were being researched with a fairly pure regard to prevailing standards of logic and theory. The problem was the prevailing standards in science at the time were still hung up on Aristotle's causes. More particularly, the idea that Aristotle's final cause had essentially been thrown away, denied, given trash status by Bacon and the others who had established the scientific method. And by the 1930s, it was pretty much a bad word to talk about purpose to talk about goals and objectives as being any, any allowable aspect of the behavior of any system, be it mechanical or biological. Rosenblut basically stepped through. It's a, it's a very nicely written little essay. I recommend it to you. And explained why in biological organisms the concept of purpose is distinct from cause that it is possible for an organism to be self-regulating and by extension a mechanical system. In fact, he mentions mechanical systems. That the mechanism for this regulation isn't some mysterious, mystical, vitalistic kind of element, but rather it's feedback, which at that time was a new thing known from electrical and electronic engineering. He differentiated between positive and negative feedback, he explained that negative feedback has a teleological or purposive effect by virtue of mediating or helping to steer the trajectory of behavior based on outputs or results of prior behavior, and that you don't have to worry about Aristotle anymore. It is entirely natural for systems to steer themselves. Philip? Does he give a specific example of non-feedback? Non-feedback, yeah. purposeful, yeah, active. Yeah, it says it can be subdivided into two classes. Uh, yes. I can't imagine an example of the second class. You, does he get, is he helpful? Non-feedback, non-teleological. He's using the term teleological in the sense of, more or less in the sense of, of steering. Yeah. Purpose rather than cause. Yeah. And there is an entire, there's actually an unpacking of, what, six to eight different categories, distinctions that he draws among those. 